All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Connor Seifer with Job Service Kalispell. Thank you so much for joining us this October morning to attend Blueprint for Business Success's third seminar in 2023. Virtual attendees are muted during the presentation, but we do encourage you to use the chat box for asking questions, which will be monitored and addressed as time allows. As always, we ask that your questions and comments are polite and respectful to all attendees and the presenter. Your input is important. At the end of the seminar, we encourage all participants to take the anonymous two-minute survey provided, and viewer participation enables us to enhance this program and keep providing Montana businesses with relevant topics and content. Today, we have the privilege of learning about options for healthcare coverages available. Please allow me to introduce the subject matter expert presenting today, Jennifer Green, who is a cash flow coach and founder of Hello Cashflow. For over 25 years, Jennifer Green has been building and growing businesses by coaching clients in the arena of benefits options. She is often described as the connector, and she knows the power of collaboration in empowering maximum results. The goal of her company, Hello Cashflow, is to free up the processes and streamline offerings to increase the overflow of resources for her clients. She resides in Kalispell, Montana, and is a business enthusiast in rural, low population areas. Please welcome Jennifer Green. Welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me today to give you a quick presentation that we're calling Crack the Benefits Code. We're gonna talk about options for your healthcare coverage today. But first, a little bit more about me. Um, Hello Cashflow is a coaching entity. We come alongside businesses and clients to remove roadblocks to their cash flow. And I have to give you my disclaimers, which you'll see on the screen. So I provide educational content only. Insurance products, which we're going to be talking about today, are highly regulated and are only detailed, sold, or serviced by licensed insurance producers. And so I want you to know that I am not a licensed insurance producer. I was one for 25 years, but I have no plans to sell or details to discuss. So why are we doing this today? Well, for over 25, well now 28 years, I have been working with clients in the benefits arena. And you have questions, you have confusion. And unfortunately, that's the way the marketplace is today. And what I find that you're missing is education. So my goal with this presentation is to give you that education. So if we can go back in time 28 years ago, I was a newly licensed insurance professional and I was very excited about life insurance. That was my whole purpose. But in order to get a life insurance license, you had to also get health insurance license. They're together for most states. I was in the state of Michigan. And when I learned studying for my health insurance exam was that the product is not designed the way I thought it should work or that I thought it did work. And as I talk to people throughout the last 28 years, I find that the programs you're enrolled in, you don't understand how they work. They don't work the way you thought they would. And it just leads to a lot of frustration. Now I can fast forward to the drama about that happened. There's a lot of history. We had an initiative called Hillary Care, which maybe you've never heard of, um, that was on the table, was pushing forward. I personally was fighting against. It got rebranded as Obamacare. If you've been around the block for a little bit, you know that the Affordable Care Act has changed this whole conversation. It has given a lot of great benefits on the individual market. And I'm really proud of the things that that did, but it has definitely put a bigger burden on the business market. And then I moved to Montana 12 years ago, and I found that rural low population states or even rural low population counties is how the Affordable Care Act is split out, have very limited options, which means my small business owners that I was working with as my clients had even greater frustrations. So today's presentation is all about education. I want you empowered to know that you can crack the code when it comes time to consider benefits. And hopefully I'll have you empowered to make some wiser decisions. So why do benefits matter? Well, I don't have to tell you this, but we are in a very tight workforce market. You as the business owner have fought very hard to fill your team with the right people in the right seats. And your team is looking for the whole package. But I can boil it down even worse. <laughs> this is my greatest definition of benefits. You need leverage against a bad day because one bad day could wipe any of one of us out. 
And that is the whole purpose of benefits is to make sure that on a bad day, you have some product you can lean on that you have transferred your risk to that can step in and help. The challenge is, is that you don't really know how they work. So let's first define success. The benefits as a topic is a success when it's quality over quantity. I meet with a lot of business owners that are offering lots of choices to their team members, which only adds to the confusion. There are costs involved. There's costs involved in your research. There's costs involved that you are paying for when you enroll. There are costs involved in people participating. And so we wanna make sure that we give advice as, as benefit coaches, that you are putting money in things that have value. You're gonna ask team members to participate in the costs. They're not gonna participate if there's no value behind that proposition. The insurance market calls this the participation rate. I see this happen a lot, where a company will fight really hard to put together a good benefits package, nobody participates in it, and then come time for renewal, they don't have the option to renew it because they didn't have enough households or percentage of the pool actually participating in the product. So all that work that they did in research and enrollment ends up coming to nothing. I don't want you there. I wanna come alongside or benefits coaches wanna come alongside and make sure that what you have is both usable and used. But you don't understand how that's gonna happen unless we break down the code. Insurance likes to hide right now behind a lot of sales tactics. If you call an insurance agent, they're gonna to talk to you about their insurance product. There's not very few resources or voices out there are telling you about the whole market or to give you a flyover view. And that's my goal with this presentation is that maybe we can step back a second and take a look up at what these products are, how they're priced and how they can actually be used. And then maybe we can make some better choices. If you have shopped for benefits, you know it's really hard to get to pricing. There's a lot of work that you have to do ahead of time. So maybe I can help us understand how to find that pricing so we can make better choices. So here's what I'm gonna lean on. I'm not an insurance agent. I might say that a few times this time during this presentation, but every year there's a benchmark survey that comes out in the fall called the Kaiser Family Foundation Employer Benefits Benchmark Study. How's that? It's a big long name. Anyway, I've been waiting for this presentation, to, this survey to come out and it came out last week, October 18th. And I will send you the link so that you can look at it yourself. But what it does is they have surveyed businesses, large businesses to small businesses, to see what it is they are offering. And they break down the programs in an average. So here's what they just published for 2023. Amid rising inflation, annual family premiums, so for a family, that's employee, spouse, and however many kids they have, for employer-sponsored health insurance. So that's group health insurance that the employer is offering to their team. The premiums, again, we can define those names. Premiums is how much you're paying per month, or in this case, per year. It, those premiums climbed 7% on average for 2023 to reach $23,968. A sharp departure from virtually no growth in premiums last year. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the cost of those programs for a family and employer offered group health benefits for smaller firms averages 2,000 a month. That's the cost of the benefit. Now you probably need an aspirin. Hang on, we're gonna move forward and I'm gonna break this down for you. But I do like to break it down for my clients. I call it benefits math. So if we take the total premium for the whole year for whatever we're offering and we divide that by 2,000 hours, because that's what your payroll is for a 50 week payroll gear. That will give us our cost per hour. So what Kaiser Family Foundation is saying is that the average family employer sponsored premium for group health benefits is $12 an hour. So if you're gonna be hiring somebody at $30 an hour and you wanna offer them full coverage health insurance for their family, you probably need to understand that you're really paying them $42 an hour if it's the time plus the benefit. So we're going to see to keep that in mind as we move forward. I use a coaching worksheet when I work with my clients. And so this is my worksheet that I use with everyone, which I love. I want to break down three different types of benefits so we can see how they work, how there's choices, and how they can even work together. But I also want to do 
three things for each one. I wanna describe the program so that you understand what these terms are. I wanna look at pricing, and then I wanna show you an example so you can see how they're actually used. Because if you put any of these in place, your employees or even yourself, when you go to use them, you should understand how they work. So let's start with health insurance. This is probably the most common used for benefits with employers, but most people don't understand how they work. First of all, I want you to know that they're government regulated and government mandated. Regulated means that they can only be described, serviced, sold by a licensed insurance producer. And, that, and that's by state. And those states are gonna hold those producers to a high target. And so they're gonna make sure that they are working ethically, that they are describing the programs correctly, that their sales tactics are approved by the state. Everything you see in the insurance market will have some kind of tagline saying that it's been approved by the state for consumer use um, because they wanna make sure that the consumer isn't confused. It's also mandated. If you're an employer and you're gonna offer health insurance, there is a mandate. If you have over a hundred employees, you're mandated to offer it, offer it. I don't like working with those companies. I don't like mandates. I do work with a few. Um, prefer it if you have 99 or less though, because uh, that makes a whole lot less headaches if we're not working with government mandates. You're also mandated to participate in the costs. So for most employers, there's always exceptions, but for most employers, your, ex your mandate is that you will pay for 50% of the employer cost or of the employee cost to cover their health insurance. I'll show you how that works in a breakdown in a minute. So terms to consider. I don't care if it's car insurance or home insurance. This is the same. A deductible simply means that it's your first dollars that you pay before the coverage comes into place. You probably know this from car insurance. If you're in a car accident and you have a thousand dollar deductible and your car is in the shop, you're going to pay a thousand dollars and then your car insurance carrier, maybe it's State Farm, is going to come in and they're going to negotiate the rest to put your car back together. But your out-of-pocket is that $1,000. It's the same thing in health insurance. There is a deductible on health insurance. You should probably know what your deductible is. So one of my favorite questions to ask people, you have health insurance. What's your deductible? Most people don't know. Let's get better at that. Let's know what our deductible is. That's your first dollars that you're gonna to need to pay before the coverage even applies. But my favorite number that I like to show people is the max out of pocket. Did you know there was a max out of pocket? Most people don't. Max out of pocket is the additional dollars that you're going to pay before you are done paying for your cost for the year. So the way it works is if say you have a thousand dollar deductible and let's say your max out of pocket is 3,500. That means that after you pay your first dollars of a thousand, you're going to pay the difference. It's a cost share ratio. You pay part, they pay part. Every ratio is a little bit different until you reach the magic number of $3,500 out of pocket. And then you have no more costs that you need, which is great if you're having a heart attack and the ambulance comes and you go to the hospital and it's a six figure hospital bill, you're only going to be out of pocket $3,500. It's not great if you thought that the thousand dollars was your max out of pocket. And now you're surprised by hospital bills that keep coming in. So this is where I like to point out that really your cost is that max out of pocket, which we're gonna look at. Co-pays is another confusing part of a health insurance program. This is your costs that do apply towards your deductible, but it's a way to break it down. So maybe your office visits have a $50 copay. That means that when you go to the doctor, you're gonna be expected to pay $50. That can apply towards your deductible, but you're not waiting for the deductible to hit before you, the coverage applies for a doctor visit. Some programs, and a lot of programs that I see today, they don't have a copay for a doctor's office. It says that it's no cost after deductible, which means you're gonna be paying out of pocket when you go to the doctor's office for that visit until you hit that thousand dollar mark. So there are some details we need to consider when we're looking at health insurance. We need to look at what, how prescriptions are handled. It's different on every program. Again, office visits. How is maternity handled is a great question I like to ask my business owners when they have team members that are in the maternity era of their family life. It's different in every program. Mental health is different on every health insurance program. Chiropractic is probably the most misunderstood benefit 
on health insurance and probably the one that gives me the most complaints when I'm working with clients. It doesn't work the way you think it does. So we should probably figure out how that works before we start telling our team that they have chiropractic now and go see a doctor. Each program is different, but these are the things you should be asking when you're considering health insurance as an option for your group. So let's look at pricing. Now, because I don't have an insurance license, I can't talk about specific products, but you do know, you should know that the Affordable Care Act has offerings for your specific county. Some states, it's the same product for each county. Some states, it's different county by, by county. It's all based on where you are headquartered. So I'm using the Kaiser Family Foundation survey as my example. So we're looking at national averages. I will warn you though, that in my low population rural areas I work with, they're usually on the higher end of the average. But let's look at the average just for now. So if you have an employee only, like only th that is the only person on the policy, on the program. So you hire Joe, he's single, he's 30. He is an employee only on your group health insurance. His average premium across the country is $727 a month. You as the employer have a mandate to pay 50% of that. That means you pay $364 a month and he's gonna pay $364 a month. Now, if he's financially strapped at the, weight, the rate that you're paying him, like maybe he lives in Flathead County, Montana, and it's very expensive to live here, right? Like we've seen wages go up a lot in our home area, but we've also seen housing go up. If he can't afford that $364 a month, then he's not gonna participate and that affects your participation rate. On this program, that's he's now paying three, $364 a month for, it has a deductible. The average deductible on this plan is $2,400 a year. That's a lot of deductible. I find the deductibles every year keep going up as well as the pricing of the programs. Um, when I first started working with group health insurance, the average was 800 was the deductible. Now it's 2,400. But like I said, I like the max out of pocket. So let's look at that max out of pocket. It's $3,500 for Joe. Well, let's look at Joe. So here's my examples. So Joe, Joe's a 30 year old single guy who's on your team. He gets a sinus infection every spring. This is so common. So he goes to urgent care like he always does, but this time he has health insurance and he's so excited he shows his card. He goes to urgent care and they give him a bill for $300. Then they gave him a prescription and he has to pay $40 for his prescription. His out-of-pocket costs are considered applied towards that deductible, but we haven't hit that $2,400 number yet. So it's still out-of-pocket. He's out-of-pocket $340. Funny thing is last year when he did this and he didn't have health insurance, he was out-of-pocket $340. He's probably not very happy with the way this is used, right? He's probably in your office complaining. Let's, let's say there's Susie. She's also single and on your plan and she breaks a leg on ski season up on the mountain. So now we have to get him, get her off the mountain to the emergency room, probably facing surgery, probably facing physical therapy. How is that handled? Well, she's gonna pay the first $2,400 of her medical bills. I can promise you her medical bills are way north of that, right? Uh, but then she's gonna cost share and get all these itemized bills until she gets to that max out of pocket of $3,500. In the scope of things, she got a great benefit because she only had to pay $3,500. But she's also paying $364 every month for her health insurance. Did she have the extra $3,500 to pay for a bad day? She may or may not be happy with the way the program worked. But what about families? Oh, families. So again, a family is defined as your employee plus a spouse plus as many children as they have on the program. That premium, if I break it down, is $1,968 a month. Most employers are mandated to pay for 50% of the employee cost, and they're going to make it fair across the board. You don't have to. You can be more generous for the families. You get to help design the program. But let's just keep it at that $364. You did it for Joe. Now we're going to do it for Julie and her family. So that left Julie to pay the rest. So that's $1,604 a month that she is going to pay just to have health insurance for her, for her family. Her deductible is the same, it's $2,400, but that's per person. And we have at least three people on this plan, but we have a family max out of pocket. This is what's different. 
Typically it's two times the max out of pocket. So the good news is for Julie is that her max out of pocket is only $7,000. Wow, that's still a lot of money though, right? I need more aspirin. So let's look at Julie. All right. It's always about the kids when it's a family program. So let's say Julie has a four-year-old who keeps getting sick. So we've probably had lots of office visits and prescriptions that have had to be paid for before we got to this point, but now it's time for surgery. She needs to get her tonsils out. So Julie is now a mom panicked about her four-year-old having surgery. We'll deal with that emotion later, but she's gonna be responsible for that first $2,400. And then she's going to get those itemized bills until she gets to that max out of pocket of, that's right, $3,500. But she also has a 10-year-old boy. He breaks his arm playing baseball. These are actually real clients of mine. He needs surgery to correct the break. So now, second claim, Julie's going to be responsible for an additional $2,400 because it's another person. And then she's going to get itemized bills until she gets to $3,500. And now she's hit her family max out of pocket. And this is where we joke that it's time for anybody else who needs any kind of health care to go to the doctor. And I will say I have a client last year who will probably watch this. And we had five people in his household have surgery in December of last year because they hit their max out of pocket. So we might as well get whatever else needs to get fixed. Um, and there was a lot of meals that came over and a lot of us had to help like take care of the house and feed the dog because they were all laid up. Anyway, Christmas was great in that household. Um, so her max out of pocket was $7,000. Something to consider when we're talking about how it works with our with our employees and ourselves, right? Because you as a business owner are probably participating in this too. Okay, so I have a summary of what that looks like. It's government regulated and mandated. The employer is going to pay 50% at least. You can be more generous if you want. Our costs, our employee only is $727 a month. The family average is $1,968 a month. And we have our max out of pockets listed. Okay, I don't know about you. I own a business. I can't afford that. I, I couldn't offer that to my team. I also have watched people go into bankruptcy because they have coverage and they can't pay those out, out, max out of pockets. And so I, I just can't do that for my team. So I went out to find some solutions that I could do as an alternative. So let's look at the top alternative right now uh, in the marketplace, and that's medical cost sharing. First of all, as I described the program, medical cost sharing is not insurance. Did I mention that I am not an insurance agent? I feel like I have to keep giving disclaimers, but I do. These programs are not government mandated and they're not government regulated. And the government says that we have to use different terms because we don't want the consumers to be confused. They don't want the consumers to think they're in insurance when they really aren't. And what that has caused, you wanna guess? Yes it's caused more confusion in the marketplace. Thanks for trying government, we appreciate that. Anytime I have a client that chooses these options, I have them sign a disclaimer that says, I understand this is not insurance. I have them sign it and a lot of my clients write and I'm thankful for that because without the government in the way, we can actually get to the core issue which is taking care of people on a bad day. There's some terms to consider. Other than talking about premiums, they are membership contributions. If you have this plan and you call your medical cost sharing entity to ask them a question and you call it a premium, they will correct you and tell you that it's a membership contribution because again, the government says we can't confuse terms, which makes it more confusing. So monthly contribution simply means that's the amount that you pay. Every plan defines this differently. One of them calls it an IUA, which is an initial unshareable amount. And that is the first dollars that you pay before any incident goes into a pool. So how these programs work, your monthly contributions every month minus a small service fee because the companies have to survive and it is small. They operate on very thin margins. That monthly contribution minus the service fee goes into a bucket of money. And so this pool of money is sitting here with all this money. You have an incident that happens, you pay your first dollars and whatever is left over, they negotiate just like an insurance carrier would. And then whatever they end up having to pay comes out of that pool. So as long as the pool is deep enough, you're gonna have your incident paid for. 
there's some stop gaps and some helps to make sure that the pool doesn't run out of money, but it's not government mandated or government regulated. So the government isn't a part of that conversation. There's pluses and minuses to that. Each plan is different. There are details to consider. You probably should understand how prescriptions work or office visits or maternity or mental health or chiropractic. Does that sound like the same list? Cause it is. Um, on how that works on these programs, because it's gonna be different. It's not health insurance. They typically don't have co-pays. So we need to consider how that applies for your specific team or your specific business. Let's look at some pricing. So, so I am using the team's um, design from a medical cost sharing group called Sidera. Probably have never heard of them. They don't do a lot of marketing. Um, but for an employee only in a team has to have at least three households participating. So I can get into the smaller groups with this product. For an employee only, the monthly contribution is $212. The IUA, again, the first dollars that you are gonna to have to spend per incident, I'll define that in a second, is $1,500. And the max on these programs for Sidera says that you only have to pay for three incidences a calendar year. If you have a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, I just had a client have a sixth, um, you aren't paying that $1,500 again. So the max you'll pay is for three. So three times 1,500 is my math is right, $4,500. So what's an incident? Well, let's go back to our examples. So Joe, single guy on your team, gets a sinus infection every year. He got, that's an incident. Go, he needs to have some health care for that incident. He goes to urgent care. He's responsible for his bill of $300 plus the cost of his prescription of $40. His out-of-pocket costs are considered applied towards his first IUA or initial unshareable amount, which was $1,500. He hasn't hit that number yet. His out-of-pocket is $340, which by the way, was just like last year with health insurance and just like the year before without any coverage at all. And so he's still frustrated. Sorry, Joe, but that's how these plans work. Susie, on the other hand, breaks a leg during ski season. That's an incident, right? I'd agree that's an incident. So all of those costs involved in her coming off the mountain, going to the ER, having surgery scheduled, physical therapy, whatever else is needed to get her well, she's going to be responsible with the first $1,500. The rest of it is going to be negotiated and will go into that membership pool. And the medical cost sharing group will pay out the rest of it. What's different about medical cost sharing is that they will continue paying for her healing as long as it takes for her to be healed. It doesn't reset at the calendar year. Health insurance resets every January. So Jennifer's tip for success is don't have a heart attack in December because that means you got two deductibles to, never mind. I've already given you a headache. Anyway, but here with Susie, let's say she did break her leg in December. She's not gonna have it reset in January as far as her costs go. It's gonna track along. And if her physical therapy takes long or there's a second surgery that's needed a year later, it all still falls under that incident. So it's giving her better protection for that incident. But let's look at families. Monthly contribution on this plan is $627 a month. There's no employer mandate to participate in that cost. So something that we would talk about if you were one of my clients is how much of that do you want to participate with? The IUA is the same. I still you know, use that $1,500. The max is still three per year, but you have more than one person on the program. So let's see how it works. Well, let's go back to Julie. Julie's four-year-old needs her tonsils out. She's probably hit that $1,500 initial unshareable amount just in the doctor visits and costs that she's had up to this point. But if she hasn't, that's all she's gonna have to pay from doctor visits to healing is that $1,500 for her four-year-old. The pool is going to pay the rest. And again, it doesn't reset in the calendar year. Her 10-year-old who breaks his arm playing baseball, boys, same deal. So she's gonna pay that first $1,500 and the pool is gonna negotiate or the company's gonna negotiate and the pool is gonna pay out the rest. Her, her total obligation financially is $3,000. That's it. And she's got one more that she could do this year before everything's paid up and we can rush everybody into surgery. I'm just kidding. Really just did that for that one family that was special. Anyway, um, so that's medical cost sharing in a quick nutshell. It's not government involved. It's self-enrollment. 
the cost for employee is two twelve a month for family at six twenty seven a month. Costs shared are based on incidences, not an annual deductible like we saw over there. And I used fifteen hundred dollars as an example. The max IUA a year on this plan is three, and so the max that you'd be out of pocket is forty five hundred dollars. I'm going through this fast, but we're gonna go to the next one. All right, next is supplemental programs. There's a whole world of supplementals out there. I see a lot of small business owners that use this as a way to stop the gap and offer something. My advice is that these are not designed to stand by themselves. They really are designed to sit on top of something else, but they can be anything. It can be group life insurance, disability insurance. There's indemnity coverage. Doesn't that sound exciting? Um, you probably know this is Aflac. But there's, there are programs out there that will pay if you have specific incidences that happen or if you go to the hospital to pay you cash. And there's also direct primary care. Now, out of this giant menu, I chose direct primary care to talk about because it is another really hot topic. Direct primary care is a membership-based primary care practice. So think of it as a subscription. You pay a subscription fee to a doctor practice. And that doctor is on call for you 24-7, 365. I've participated in this. I have a lot of clients that have this for their teams. You can have a doctor on call for your team. Um, it's great. I can text my doctor questions. I can call them anywhere. I famously FaceTimed my doctor in Montana when I was in Florida, when I was fighting with a pharmacist at CVS. And I let the pharmacist fight with my doctor. It was awesome. So <laughs> I kind of got a video of the whole thing. Anyway, it's you have a choice in this market. It can be local solutions. There are doctors in your market, most likely that are offering this. And we can talk about which of those doctors are, but there's also telehealth solutions. So if you're a national company that have a lot of employees across the board, there are telehealth remote solutions that are in the direct primary care space. Again, it depends on your team and what you're looking to do. This can fill in the gap for a high deductible, which I think at this point, all the deductibles are high. That's my opinion, or a medical cost sharing plan. Typically, the costs run about $75 a month for an employee only, about $200 a month for a family. So how does this work? Well, I'll just go back to Joe because we've left him very disappointed, right? So let's say that Joe has, I don't care if it's group health insurance or a medical cost sharing plan. Either way, he was still out of pocket that $340. With a direct primary care membership being offered by his employer, Joe, when he gets a sinus infection, he's not going to urgent care. He's going to that team doctor. And he can probably do that by the, a phone call, is what I see often, and do a telehealth analysis and phone call with that doctor. The doctor then can call the local Walgreens for his prescription. He can swing by on his way to work, get on his prescription, and if he's feeling well enough, he can just go to work. He's not lost time by sitting at urgent care all day, being exposed to who knows what at this point, right? And he's got a relationship with the doctor who's gonna make sure that he is recovering from it. There's great follow-up calls, but just the level of care is much higher. But the best news for Joe is the only thing he's out of is the cost of the prescription. And because his direct primary care doctor knows that he's out of pocket for his prescription costs, I'm just using this as an example, the doctor's more likely to give him a generic versus a name brand because a direct primary care doctors are very aware of the costs of the use of, of healthcare and they fight really hard to keep all of your incidentals as low as possible. So in this example, Joe is now paying $15 for his, his prescription and we finally have a happy employee. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so let's talk about Julie with her four-year-old. I just use this as an example. How does a direct primary care help her? Well, she's had lots of doctor visits through this whole process to find out that her daughter needs her tonsils out. She's been working with one doctor who has a high level of care and focus on her family through her direct primary care doctor. The direct primary care doctor is probably going to have an opinion about which doctor actually does the surgery. And it's probably going to help to negotiate that to make sure that the, this family is getting the best care possible. And there's going to be great follow up afterwards to make sure that the daughter actually heals. And what I have found in working with these doctors is that my clients that are using the programs have a greater level of peace knowing that they are well taken care of because they're getting all the attention that they really deserve from their primary care doctor. Works really well. No further costs for her offices, it's telehealth, those kind of things. All right, so there's my summary on direct primary care. Your team can have a, a doctor on call. On average, the employee costs are about $75 a month. 
a family is around 200, it's going to be different per practice because these are all independent business owners, just like you. They control their costs. I'm just using some good examples to throw some pricing on the sheet. It fits in well with a high deductible insurance plan or with a medical cost sharing program. The doctor visits have no cost. There's low cost incidentals and tests. It keeps your out-of-pocket costs extremely low. And you have somebody that you can call or text or FaceTime with whatever medical questions you have. And so your team is more likely to be healthy. All right, it's a lot of information, but we don't have a whole lot of time. So which programs are best for you? Well, unfortunately, you're the consumer. So you get to determine. Each team is different. Each family has unique needs, but now you get to go shopping and find out which programs are gonna best fit for you. And hopefully when you hear these terms, you're better empowered to understand what they mean and what the pricing can fit in your budget. So what are your next steps? Well, I have listed my best practices for here's my tips for success when you are considering benefits programs for your team. First of all, you need to identify some subject matter experts to help you go through the process. You also are going to need to create a team census. It's as easy as name, birthday, of all the people that are employed on your team that might be in the benefits pool. For, for health insurance, that's most likely going to be full-time people. We're looking at medical cost sharing. You could include your part-timers if you want to offer it. It's really up to you. There's no government mandate. But whoever's going to go shopping for you, whether it's an insurance agent, a broker, a benefits coach, we're all going to need a team census to know what the ages are of your group. So birthdays. It also would be great if you could determine what your benefits budget is. I've given you some numbers. You now have a headache, but these, that's just the reality of what things cost. So maybe now we can start thinking through what your budget is to set aside for your benefits program. You can check out online resources. There's lots of discussions out there on benefits. And please, by all means, get feedback from your team members because they're the ones you're going to be making the offering to. You don't want to go through all this hassle of putting a program together to find out that none of them are interested. And of course, you could always hire a benefits coach. Benefits coaching is simply an advocate who's hired to come alongside you and help. Um, they do the research alongside of you. They can help answer the questions that you have, kind of the gatekeepers to keep the salespeople away. Not that they're bad, but we want to consider more than just one option when we're looking at benefits coaching. So, and as a benefits coach, my goal is just to make sure that your program that you put into place is quality, that it's used and that it's usable. And I find a lot of times that's what the business owners are looking for is just someone to come alongside. So thank you for participating in my Crack the Code presentation. And now we're gonna open it up for some questions. Any questions from my live audience? Well, we do have a question from the virtual audience. Nice. Am I correct that medical cost sharing plans are only available to employers with less than 50 employees? Yes. You are correct. Well, at this point, yes, there are some designs that are being proposed that are over 50 employees um, and I have a good workaround. But um, yes, you own a business, you control how the entity is structured. Um, but yes, 50 is the limit right now for what we're offering in medical cost sharing. Good question. Yes. Does cost sharing also have preventative care? Depends on the solution. So if I was working with you, for instance, and that's important for your team, then we need to look at some solutions that offer that, or how can we get to that? Obviously, everyone has to control their costs. So it's not just a free for all where you can use whatever. There are gonna be some limits on some things. That's why I had that list. Um, mental health is a great example. Everyone wants mental health. It's a hot topic right now. It's a real challenge to have mental health in the group health insurance space and in the medical cost sharing space. So we need to start talking about some other solutions around that and how we get to med mental health. Um, and I've got some great success stories with that too, that we can consider case by case, but great question. Yes. Are there products or solutions for associations, not a business, an association that has a lot of businesses coming together yes. to help um, leverage their members. That was such a hot topic about 10 years ago, um, where it, the pricing could be lower the larger your group. And so all these associations popped up and they were able to offer programs through that. We still have some of those to this day. 
Um, and that is something that we should definitely take into consideration when we're looking, especially as small business owners. Typically on medical health insurance and even in the associations, you, they're going to have a, a, a pool limit of how many people you have to have participate. So it could be five, it could be 10, depends on the association. Um, but that is definitely something that you should consider when you're looking at benefits for your, your program as well. How can we link arms, right? Or need some help? Yes. Um, in the regular health insurance realm, there's only three really carriers. In the state of Montana, you have three choices. Yes. yes. Negotiations to get other carriers into our state? Or um, I'm not aware of negotiations, but I will tell you that I'm thankful that Montana has three. I have some areas that I work in where they have one. I have one market that I work in that for individual health insurance, there's none, like zero. Because even with these costs, the carriers are still having a hard time staying in business. So, so I'm thankful we have three in Montana. In my opinion, they mirror each other. I don't see a whole lot of difference between them. I have friends who work for all three, so hi. Um, but I'm thankful we have three choices. It just adds to the frustration. And that has everything to do with the Affordable Care Act and how it broke things down by county. So we have a lot of counties in Montana that they are lucky that our state auditor's office has fought hard to maintain three statewide. Because if we were considered county by county like they do in Ohio, there's a lot of a lot of Montana would have zero options. So the state is fighting for you. It just isn't working the way you expected it to because it's just such a giant monster. That's a great question. Yes. <laughs> Lady in the back has another question. What is your opinion on uh, traditional health care with health costs, saving the cash, HSAs? Oh, HSAs. Oh, that was part of my story. It makes my heart sad. <laughs> so when I first became an insurance broker, uh, producer, I worked on an initiative with George W. Bush administration on how to open the health savings accounts to everyone. You might not know this, but back then, an HSA was only available to the business owner. Um, and so we were able to break that open and have it available to everyone. Um, when Obamacare came into play, actually it was Hillary Care had the proposal. Obamacare came into play. We call it the Affordable Care Act is its actual term. Congress has been playing with health savings accounts ever since then. And I will tell you for my rural, low population states, I have not yet found a way to get you into a health savings account with the offering that you'd have to be in. Um, so the advantage of a health savings account is that you're putting dollars away like a 401k for your future health insurance needs or health care needs. I love that. In order to get into it today, you have to be into a high deductible plan. And that's not what I showed you here. It's in even harsher design and it has an even higher cost. And so you're going to end up putting more money into a plan to get a tax benefit that's low level. So when I pencil it out, I just can't get it to work. Maybe somebody watching this has a solution and can email me and tell me how they figured it out. Um, I haven't seen it pencil, so that's unfortunate. I do have clients that are in those plans. I will say we do that for tax advantage reasons. They are making a lot of money right now. I have some clients that are making a lot of money and they're looking for a way to push those resources into the future. And so they're paying more for their health insurance than you would ever want to, um, but they are able to then fund HSAs for their future needs. And that makes sense for them but they're my rarity. Not every client I talk to says they have more money than they know what to do with. But if you do, call me. I have some suggestions. Heard uh, that um, in the future, I don't know if it's already uh, available, but for HSA savings, you can roll over into retirement. Yes, that is a proposal that's on the table, which is really great if you're a congressman because they have HSAs. Yes. Okay, don't get me started. Sorry, sorry to my legislators. Um, yeah. Do kind of love you. Okay, just kidding. Um, I, I do a lot of work. I do a lot of advocacy on the state level for multiple states and with our federal level, um, just fighting to get some of these spaghetti messes cleared up. Um, I would love to see HSAs come back for real. I would love to see it available to everyone. I would love for you to have the responsibility to put dollars away today to pay for your healthcare costs in the future because they are only going up and they, the costs are just obscene. I just saw a news article this morning that Paxlovid, which is a COVID treatment, um, is now being priced at $1,800 a dose. 
So it's great if you got health insurance and they're paying for it, but it's actually hurting the carrier, right? Because they've got to pay for it. You might be at your max out of pocket. Yeah, we, we have a lot of problems in the healthcare chain. It's not just this, um, but this is what we can control. So let's focus on what we can do and then we'll fight for the rest. But good question. Yes, oh, yes. So many I questions. Just, I just wanted to say, um, I have a client that you were very instrumental in getting it set up um, that has the medical cost sharing, that has the DPC, that has the AFLAT, and uh, also now has telehealth. And I've been very impressed with how well it's worked for them for a small business employer. It's, it's very affordable when you add it all up. So is your client that's using the solution, are they participating in the costs or they pass all the costs on to their employees? They are paying 100% of the medical cost sharing program. They're paying 100% of the telehealth and the DPC. And then so, the AFLAC is voluntary. Okay. But it's So just repeat that so if you guys heard that online. So she has a client that's using medical cost sharing, DPC, telehealth, and AFLAC. And the employer has decided to pay for the medical cost sharing, the DPC, and the telehealth portion. So when we look at costs, if on average in health insurance, they'd be paying $364, that would be that half, half C's of the cost. I have a lot of employers that are saying that. Like when we look at the menu of choices, they were mad about the 364, but then they tell me I'd pay up to 400 or $450 to be able to tell my team that I'm paying for all the costs. Um, because they can have a stronger offering that's actually usable and will be used to give to their team. The team feels, feels taken care of. I have other clients that have that same type of design where they're not paying a penny, uh, but, the, but the employees are feeling great and empowered because they have options to get into lower cost options. It really just depends on how you want to handle your design. But thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. That's a great client. I worked on that one too. So I, I appreciate hearing that. Well, and the total cost is about $300 to the yeah, employer. Yeah, their total cost out of pocket. It's, for the benefits program, per employee is $300. So it's a great, it is a great design. We get into real numbers. Yes, was there another virtual question? We sure do. Um, do, or excuse me, we currently offer direct primary care for the owner, two full-time employees and two part-time. Are the other options discussed today available to small companies like us? Yes. You have choices that are there. They're gonna be, in, if they're per your design. So we'd have to take a look at individual situations. But um, I, I have a lot of companies that are using part-time employees that they're also including in these designs. Again, I have clients that have part-time employees that they're not. It's really up to you and how you wanna set it up. For medical cost sharing, I have to have, the Every design I've seen needs at least three households um, in order to participate. Um, but typically you have three. That's not you and your husband and your kid. You're one household, by the way. That's my number one question. They're like, we're a team of two. It's me and my husband. Well, there's actually an individual market for that in medical cost sharing. I was just looking at, at some group offerings. So you're not out of the woods, um, but um, it's per household. Good question. We do have another one from the virtual audience. How do you advise your clients considering offering these benefits for the first time to get feedback from their team members without overwhelming them or giving them a headache? The <laughs> um, I would say, are you confused and do you have a headache? I, it's, I'm sorry. I wish it was easier. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a team conversation. And I, I advise people to have a team meeting and talk about, like get around, around a table and talk about what you wanna do. Um, let them know your heart that you want to offer things, but like, these are the costs. So how are we going to navigate this? Um, and let them be a part of the conversation. Um, a benefits coach will probably offer to help facilitate that discussion if you want that help. Um, but you know, it would be, it's really tragic when I see people that have fought really hard to put things in place and then nobody wanted it, you know, or they lose a key employee because they assume that everyone has their coverage at their spouse's business. Well, guess what? Those are the costs. You know, so we see a lot of split households where wife has her coverage at her business and husband has his coverage through his employer um, because of the way that the model is set up. 
Um, and so we really need to look at this by case by case. I wish there was a blanket answer, but we haven't gotten there yet in our country. So good question. We're just rolling in. Uh, there is another one in the virtual audience, if nobody okay. else here. Um, what is the best way to shop the cost sharing plans? Uh, you could Google medical cost sharing plans and take a look. You'll see quite a few. Um, they do not get, they don't pay commission on those products. And so there's not a lot of marketing that they're doing. Um, I will say in that umbrella, there's two different types of entities. One is religious based. So if you listen to talk radio at all, you've heard the um, radio ads for MediShare. Um, they're Christian based. You're going to have to sign a statement of faith in order to get into their plan. It doesn't work so well in an employer group when we can't discriminate against religion. That's a bummer. Um, MediShare has tried to get into the group space, but they're kind of pigeonholed. Um, then there's also ethically based medical cost sharing plans. There are several. They're all designed differently. I am a geek. I like to just be a nerd and study their entities. And I have opinions. I like that pool of money that's there to pay for incidences. I like it to be deep. I prefer it to be backed by some investment dollars in case they were to get exhausted. Um, those are the kind of questions that I would be asking if I was can I have you go out and just self-enroll? In the state of Montana, they are self-enrollment platform. Um, Montana, in our legislative session two sessions ago, it was determined that they can't pay commissions and enrollments need to take place at their home office. So it is self-enrollment. So you're going to call an 800 number and work with their home office if you're not going to use an advocate like a health benefits coach to stand in between. Um, but they're really helpful. And I find they're very transparent, all of them. And they know where their strengths and where their weaknesses are. And so you can have really good conversations with them. Um, it's pretty exciting to see how that's changing. And it is changing. I expect to see some new offerings in that market in the next year or two. There's some more groups that are being funded right now, which is exciting. I like competition. The more, the merrier. Makes us all be better. Um, but that's that's what I would do. I would, I would simply Google metal, medical cost sharing and see what it comes up with. Just be aware that the religious-based ones are really not applicable to your business. They're great for you as an individual if you decide to go that route. Good question. Maybe we can squeeze one last one in. What if I have employees in multiple locations or states? That's a great question. So medical health insurance is based on where you are. So for instance, my husband works for a company that's based in Chicago. And so um, there's like 100 employees in my county that work for this employer. And they're all running around with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois cards because that's where their health insurance comes from. Um, so they are on the Illinois designs, not on the Montana designs. Um, medical cost sharing is national. There's, there's no territory. So wherever your employees are, mm, I'll put an asterisk. There's a couple states where they're not available. So we have to be kind of aware of where those are. Um, but pretty much, I think, we're in, I think medical cost sharing is in 46 states at this point. Um, so your, it doesn't matter where your employees are. It doesn't matter where they go in for service. They typically don't have in-network, out-of-network. They'll tell you that they use the largest PPO network for providers, but that's pretty much everybody with health insurance uses P PPO providers. Everybody's in that. Anyway, it's all kind of geeky. Um, so you can have a plan that's based in Montana, but you're covering employees in multiple states under that one plan, same design. Um, for DPC, obviously that's different. Like my local DPC doctor is here. Um, and although that practice probably would offer coverage telehealth to other places, there's other ways of getting to DPC for your other employees that aren't here. And that's something, again, we can design. You're in the driver's seat on that, so you get to design it. That's a great question. Thank you. All right, well, I guess our time is... Thank you so much, Jennifer, oh, again. thank you. Wonderful question. Thank you very much. Yeah, seriously, thank you for gifting your time and sharing that experience on this topic. Tons of information. I hope you all have your head medication at home. Uh, so we will be leaving Jennifer's contact information up at the end in case you have any further questions for her. And this will wrap up our October 2023 Blueprint for Business Success Fall Seminar. However, please stick around for the following important information. Within the next week, all registrants will receive an email with access to the recording, so you can rewatch it, as well as any handouts and relevant links from today. Please follow Job Service Kalispell on social media and subscribe to our business email list to catch the next blueprint and stay current on upcoming events. And lastly, we appreciate your feedback 
in that anonymous survey that will pop up when you click on the leave at the end of the seminar. Your feedback will help us improve the program and offer future topics and content that is useful to Montana businesses. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you.